Welcome back to another episode of Rethink Reshoring. Happy Tuesday, everybody. I'm Kaylee Nix here with Rosemary Coates from the Reshoring Institute. We're super excited to welcome you guys back into this show. Rosemary, how's it going today? How have things been? Hi, good morning, Kaylee. I think the rest of the country is suffering from heat. Um, and here in the Bay Area, it's only about 65 degrees. So it's weird, huh? The weather is really strange. I, I love that. And you know what? San Francisco, always a great place to be in the summer. It helps cool you down. We're excited to get back into another episode of Rethink Reshoring because we have a really interesting topic today. We're talking about global labor rates. And of course, if we go back to our very first episode, one of those main reasonings when we talk about reshoring or nearshoring initiatives or even outsourcing initiatives is to save a little bit of money when it comes to labor. So we're going to break down what that means, what that looks like and why labor rates aren't necessarily as cheap as we think that they are today. So let's dig right into it. Of course, everybody knows China is famously known for low cost labor and a lot of, a lot of it, right? A lot of labor availability. But is that actually the case? You guys at the Reshoring Institute did a study not too long ago looking at global labor rate comparisons. Can you tell us a little bit about what that found? Yeah, so we uh, had a look at labor rates across the world um, to do a comparison so that we would understand uh, if labor rates are um, ra rising in China, if they're comparable to other places around the world and so forth. So we, we conducted a study um, a few months ago, actually it was published just before the holidays, and uh, we looked at uh, uh, 10 job categories in 12 countries. And uh, we picked these particular countries because these are the places we know our clients are moving to or want to move to. And so we did a comparison like that to, to determine if the labor rates are the same or cheaper or more expensive in these particular areas. And then uh, compared those across where we know the labor rates are high, like the U.S. and Western Europe. So with that, what did these find? Was it that China was actually as low as we thought that it was? Or is it that it's a little bit higher than what we were expecting? Well, you're right, Kaylee. Uh, in the past, we always thought that China was a cheap place to go. And so after China ascended to the World Trade Asso uh, Association in 2001 uh, and started uh, opening its doors to manufacturing, it was not only uh, an inexpensive labor rate market, but also overall an, an inexpensive cost market. Mm -hmm. So it's cheaper to set up a factory and so forth. But over time, things changed, and uh, certainly the business conditions have changed as well. So as you mentioned, uh, labor rates have increased in China, uh, as has been reported in the press. But in addition to that, the cost overall to manufacture in China has also risen. When we look at the labor rates, though, uh, what we found was that China is no longer uh, at the low end of the labor rates, but is smack in the middle of what we what we had a look at. So even though uh, we've been uh, reporting that labor rates have increased in the recent years, I was surprised to find that they are have increased enough to make them sort of middle of the pack on the world stage for for actual per hour labor rates. And that's important because when companies uh, have labor as a big component to their total cost structure, labor becomes front and center. Uh, the, other, the other thing is uh, that labor is almost always the starting point for companies. So when an executive will say, let's evaluate whether or not we can move our manufacturing to the U.S., back to the U.S., or some other country like Mexico, almost always you start with labor rates and that's kind of the the baseline or the jumping off point for a reshoring project. So we know that during the COVID-19 pandemic, China was obviously the first country to shut down, seeing as that was kind of the place where the pandemic stemmed from. But it was also one of the last countries to open up. And because of that, their economy suffered 
greatly. Their citizens were held in pretty much complete and total lockdown. It affected the shipping industry absolutely tremendously. And it went through kind of waves of a potential reopening, a potential economic rebound, back to this, no, we're going to lock everything tight down again, which was incredibly detrimental to the way that things were done. It's led to a lot of stress on their citizens as well. How much does their pandemic response or the fact that they were in this tight pandemic response for so long, how much does that play into now this rise in wages and labor costs across China? Because the government or their factory workers have to do something to support these citizens who were kept inside and kept from earning for so long. They're at this point now where it's kind of increased wages, increased labor costs, or end up reducing jobs and reducing people's livelihoods. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So yes, uh, factories opened and closed and opened and closed all throughout the pandemic. And that uh, caused major disruptions throughout the worldwide supply chain for anyone who was sourcing in China. Um, and the labor rates never uh, backed up. So they, they continued to rise and uh, now to a point where it's fairly significant. Um, I think uh, looking at the structure of China and, you know, we are in the process of somewhat decoupling with China. Our, our economies are so much intertwined that probably it will never happen fully. But many companies are trying to de-risk, meaning they're uh, evaluating their global risk and determining where it's more effective to, to manufacture. Uh, and, you know, decoupling from the Chinese economy. And I think we're going to see a set, a steady train, uh, a steady trend uh, of decoupling over the next few years. So I, I don't think um, companies, American companies or Western European companies are ever going to completely get out of China. But there is likely to be less, um, less emphasis placed on manufacturing in China. So yeah, I mean, the economy is very important in that regard, uh, but the individual uh, or microeconomics of the firm are also very important. And by that, I mean, looking at what your cost drivers are, where is the cost of production in, in terms of how much of, is, is, of it is attributable to labor, how much is attributable to parts that are being sourced, uh, how much of it is attributable to overhead costs running the factory and so forth. So when you have labor as a big portion of that, your overall costs, if labor is very important as a cost driver, then you want to look for a low cost uh, environment, a low labor cost environment, and that's no longer China. So, so many companies are looking to alternate uh, countries as a result. So when you're looking at sourcing lower cost labor, you also have to factor in the availability of that labor, right? How many people are in a certain space to work for what you are wanting them to work for? One of those, of course, China is one because they have such a huge population center. But if you look at our chart talking about average salaries of productions for workers or machine operators, India is on that very low end of the cost scale. But we know that they are also very high on that population scale. There are a lot of people centered in India, which means a lot of available workforce. Is that why we're seeing a lot of companies capitalize on that movement? Of course, you're moving from China to India. You're still in that Asian continent. The Indian subcontinent is, of course, separated from China by the Himalayas. But it is still that decent movement in the Asian continent itself. You're able to move from an area that has a lot of available workforce to kind of that same amount of available workforce, but at roughly about half the cost. Yeah, that's that's right. So, you know, we looked at multiple job categories, so not all of them were half the cost, but many were uh, indicating that China has moved up the curve and some of the other countries are coming uh, on board at a, the very low end. So, for example, India, Vietnam and central Mexico are on the very low end. It's actually cheaper to manufacture in Mexico if you have a lot of labor content than it is in China. Uh, so, yes, that's true. Now, let's talk about the availability of labor. Uh, unfortunately, China is going through a labor shortage just as we are in the U.S. I think we posted uh, new job numbers yesterday for uh or this morning for uh, the U.S. in terms of uh, new job openings is roughly half a million new jobs that were added in the past quarter, which is astonishing. Problem is we don't have enough workers to fill all those jobs or enough skilled workers to fill those jobs. 
Uh, and the same thing is sort of happening in China. They have labor labor shortages across the big um, assembly and factory areas along uh, the Chinese eastern seaboard. And that's where most of the factories are located. So there's more population inland in rural areas, but there's not so much manufacturing going on there for a lot of reasons, particularly logistics reasons. Uh, so they're experiencing a labor shortage as well. They have lots of migrant workers that come to uh, the factory areas, but not enough to handle the, the all of the manufacturing that's required. When you look at India by comparison, um, the population is huge and uh, there's more availability of workers. However, these are not skilled workers. So uh, you have the issue in particular in India uh, that there is a limited amount of skilled labor. So you have to expect that you're going to have to train people and it'll take a while to have them come up to speed and probably productivity is lower. And the same is true of Vietnam. However, in Vietnam, uh, they only have a population of about 90 million people. So uh, they're sort of full up. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the factories are full. Uh, the people are fully employed and so forth. If you look at central Mexico, and uh, the labor rates are much cheaper in central Mexico uh, than they are along the border. So the same is true in the U.S. The labor rates are, are far less expensive in the south and the southeast than they are in, say, San Francisco, for example. Uh, so um, you know, labor rates vary inside of the country. So if you look at central Mexico, the labor rates are, are considerably lower uh, than you would find in China. So, you know, sort of depends on the country, the sophistication, uh, the skilled labor availability. So, you know, in today's manufacturing environment, you can't just walk in the door and sit down and start being a, a factory worker. Uh, today's manufacturing environment is full of robots and uh, computers and requires a different kind of understanding of manufacturing and a skill level uh, you know, to run a machine tool and that sort of thing. So that, you know, over time, the requirements have changed as well as the economics have changed. That skilled labor aspect is something that I want to do a little bit of a zoom in on because I think that it kind of changes, that definition of skill changes region to region, right? And changes from country to country, honestly. And that it's almost kind of culturally significant, I would say, right? In the United States, one of those reasons why our labor costs have increased is because we have started to value those factory workers a lot more than was typically done before. That has to do with kind of our American culture, I would believe, kind of that like American dream where we've gone from this, okay, you're an unskilled person who works in a factory to, no, you're doing a great job, you are very skilled, you are highly intelligent, and you are doing something that is necessary to the American way of life. Do we see that that is maybe maybe a cultural difference or a definition difference in some of these other countries where there's not that value placed on this worker yet, and that's why they continue to be either paid at a lower rate or we see those lower labor costs? Well, I, 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 I'm not so sure it's culturally related, but it certainly is um, uh, the maturity of an individual country in terms of manufacturing. So as company, as countries industrialize, the same in, with the Industrial Revolution in the US, as companies industrialize, the skill sets change and uh, the requirements change and people go to work and earn a living wage and therefore the middle class gets built as a result. So our industrial revolution took a hundred years or so to, to really become sophisticated in terms of industries and manufacturing. China went through their industrial revolution in like 20 years. I mean, it was so fast. It was just amazing. They went from a agricultural um, environment to an in fully industrial environment in you know 20 years or less really amazing. And as a result, as they become more sophisticated, more industrialized, uh, the wages go up. And that's a natural phenomenon. And they start to shed the lower cost, highly labor intensive requirements uh, for manufacturing to other countries. So let me give you an example. Um, you know, uh, 20 cent an hour t-shirt production 
may what used to happen a lot in China, but now that's been offshore to lower cost countries like Bangladesh and and uh, 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 Myanmar, Indonesia, uh, Honduras, places where the labor rate is significantly less. So China is actually moving up that sophistication curve, becoming more industrialized, more sophisticated, uh, and as a result, the labor rates are going up. So India is at the beginning of their industrialization at at that point, as well as Mexico and other countries in the world. So, you know, there's a there's kind of a uh, uh, an experiential curve over time uh, that results in higher labor rates and more sophistication in terms of manufacturing. Does that experiential curve and the depth that a country is where its manufacturing sector is and to its industrial revolution play any part in the treatment of their workers, not necessarily just in wages, but also the factory conditions that they work in or kind of the humanity that we treat them? I know from the United States perspective, we have kind of this almost social justice movement going on right now where companies are trying to, or consumers, that is, are trying to really fight the perils of fast fashion, specifically in the fast fashion industry, just due to the humanity of those workers. Is that something that we see as well, is as companies get further and deeper into their industrial revolution, that working conditions become more humane, you see those labor costs go up because of that, and then of course because of the payment of those workers? Yeah, I think that's a natural phenomenon. And also because there's more attention being paid to the factory environment worldwide by a number of organizations that monitor these things. Uh, so you're going to see better treatment of factory workers, I think, uh, uh, on a worldwide basis, and particularly in China. And we're already seeing a lot of that. So you know, most companies have some kind of monitoring group that oversees uh, their supplier factories, understand, make sure that there's no child labor, um, that uh, that factory workers are giving breaks, given breaks. Um, that they, you know, work no more than, say, 60 hours a week. Um, so there are those kind of things that are being focused on worldwide, for sure. And these are human rights issues that are in parallel with manufacturing. There's no question about it. So you mentioned fast fashion, really interesting industry um, that has, I think, segregated their supply chain is the way to think about it. So there is uh, the basic fast fashion shapes and sizes. So for example, you may have a, a mini skirt um, that has a certain pattern. And in the springtime, it's made out of uh, lightweight fabrics. And in the winter or fall, it's made out of heavier woven fabrics. But it's the same uh, shape and size. And so the factory workers are very productive in terms of they're making the same thing over and over again, just with different fabrics. And that um, creates an environment where um, things can be moved very quickly into a fast fashion retail side. Uh, and, um, you know, they come and go very quickly in, in seasons because the, 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 the uh, patterns are standardized. And then fast fashion adds to that as a different part of their supply chain, a certain um, maybe local products that are unique and are sold on a one-time basis, maybe a scarf or, um, you know, some kind of local fashion that's going to be made in um, another environment, maybe not China or maybe not a low-cost country, but in the U.S., for example. Fast fashion may be buying accessories and other things that are added to the collection that makes it attractive for a consumer to go into that store and buy, buy products. So fast fashion is segregated. Um, most, most companies, though, will look at their labor rates as kind of the fundamental or the baseline for, um, for making a decision in terms of where to go and manufacture. And, you know, what we found is, is things as time goes on, that uh, the labor rates change significantly enough that the companies may now be considering a different location. The the other thing to understand is that most companies have internally have multiple supply chains. So if you, for example, uh, are an apparel company and you're making your sewing fashions, um, you have a lot of labor content. Or if you're making athletic shoes, you know, when you turn over your 
your your running shoe you can see on the back there's little black squares and blue squares and there's a design and pattern each one of those is um is individually glued on to that pattern by a worker in a factory so a lot of labor involved in making athletic shoes as well as apparel and so you have to look at where it's appropriate for you to manufacture because you have a lot of labor costs so you want to look for a low cost labor environment like india or central mexico or vietnam uh, however if you're making textiles so, you know, in apparel, you've got to use textiles. In uh, athletic shoes, you have lots of textiles on the top part of the, of the shoe. Um, so if you are a textile manufacturer, that's almost all fully automated. And that means when you go into a factory, you're making uh, textiles, you have big weaving machines and so forth. There's hardly any workers. So labor is a much less component, a, a smaller component of your overall costs. The first thing that we advise our clients to do is we go through it with them is to determine how much labor is in your product and what environment should you be looking for in order to take advantage of a low cost labor uh, environment like, like India, for example. So it's, it's not exactly straightforward. It's absolutely very, very complicated. So Rosemary, I want to touch one final time on that depth and that length of time in a, company, a country's industrial revolution and how that corresponds to labor costs. Are we looking at almost kind of like a logarithmic curve when you talk about in into industrial revolution versus labor costs or more of a, a linear graph when we think about how wages grow? Does it, when a country enters their industrial revolution, do we see a very quick spike and then a leveling off? I kind of think that that's where we're at in the United States, right? versus where you see in other countries where you see you industrial industrialization taking off and then you have a quick jump in um, labor costs and then or labor wages and then it slows down. So here's the consultant's answer. Uh, it depends. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah, uh, you know, in some cases the the meteoric rise in in China's the the example. Um, the the rise in industrialization and the very fast pace that that happened also was overlaid by the government so you know the government uh, building infrastructure so you know if you go to china you know they have like 12 lane highways everywhere and uh, fast trains and you know it's an amazing infrastructure but that was built in parallel and in advance of, of industrializing and sophisticating uh, the manufacturing process. So that, that happens really fast. Not all countries are going to be capable of doing that. So India, for example, the infrastructure in many places isn't very good. They have power outages and there's, um, you know, other issues about roads and congestion and all sorts of things. So I don't think you're going to see the same speed of industrialization in, in uh, India as you did in, in China, where they have a uh, a government that can just snap its fingers and do projects. India is more of a democracy, and as a result, they go through a longer decision-making process by comparison. Uh, Mexico is some, some mix. Um, there's already a lot of manufacturing in Mexico and has been for quite some time, particularly in industries like automotive. Uh, and they are they are rapidly expanding as well, but not to the same speed or effectiveness that you would have found in China, say, 10 years ago. So it's going to take Mexico longer to go through that industrial revolution and, and complete the uh, countrywide sophistication that would be on a competitive basis. So it kind of depends on um, not only the culture, but the government of the country, um, the attitudes, the the you know all kinds of labor trends. Where are the labor? Where are the workers? Um, do they have access to factories so they can go to work? I mean, there's there's you know a lot of things to consider in that regard. Absolutely. And I, of course, the consultant's answer is it depends. Rosemary, we are out of time for today, but we've got a really exciting episode coming up next week. You mentioned that Mexican perspective, and we're going to get a little bit of a zoom in on cross-border freight. Can you talk to us just really quickly about who our guest for next week is? Yeah, so um, we have uh, Jerry Briones, who is a director at um, Brownsville Economic Development Council. 
Uh, and he's going to be talking to us about that cro cross-border trade, and particularly in Brownsville. But it's really happening all along the border. We're actually at the Reshoring Institute in the middle of a huge study on cross-border commerce, uh, all aspects of it. So Jerry will give us a little peek into what's happening in Brownsville. So make sure that you stay tuned in for next week's episode of Rethink Reassuring, 2.30 o'clock Eastern time right here on Freight Waves TV. Rosemary, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you all for staying tuned in. You can catch all of our episodes online on our Freight Waves YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts of choice. Right now, that's it for us here today. We'll see you guys next week. Mm -hmm.